Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Box Report, episode 166. I'm your host, Michael. Joining me this week, uh, Gail from Communities Digital News, uh, Jacob from Jab Hook Boxing, Daniel from the Inscriber. What's going on, ladies and gents? Evening, everybody. What's happening? Our panel of four tonight. Yeah, it seems like it. We may have a couple of folks uh, jump in later. Um, for those who are new, Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, once again, live YouTube show, podcast, as well as blog discussing all things boxing. The motto is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is if it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. If you want to find all information regarding Pound for Pound Box Report, one main place you want to go to, that's the blog page, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. That's the link. Check the right of the blog page. You'll find links to the pages on Facebook, G Plus, Tumblr, as well as the uh, Twitter page, as well as links where to listen to us on um, iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, Stitch Radio Player, FM, and Google Play Music. Uh, let's get the show started this evening, uh, recapping what went down last week. Light weekend of boxing um, in terms of in the ring stuff. Uh, one main bout to focus on um, took place in Scotland. IBFWBA um, unification bout. Uh, Ricky Burns, Julius and Dogo. And um, I wasn't surprised that Dogo won. And Dogo won by basically a shutout. I was surprised that he won by shutout and he won um, as easily as he did. Um, Goes last fight, which a lot of people saw him for the first time, his last fight when he went over to Russia and blitzed the guy out in, in less than a minute. Uh, you thought he was just some puncher, and you thought the plan was for him to go over there and just bowl and um, blitz uh, Ricky Burns. But this was a thorough beating. Uh, not only was he the uh, bigger and stronger and bigger punching guy, um, he employed a style in there. I love the way he used his height and reach. Um, I love his discipline throughout. I love the fact that he would not just jab to the head, but I love the uh, way he would go to the body on Ricky Burns from outside. Burns was hesitant throughout, and once Burns got stunned in round five, um, I, to me, the fight was over. Because you knew early on he couldn't deal with the height and reach of Burns. He couldn't deal with the height and reach of Indogo, excuse me. Uh, so he had to come in, and once he got hurt, uh, that made him even more hesitant to the point that uh, the last three, four rounds, to me, he capitulated. He relented. He quit almost. He quit without, he quit without saying that I don't want to fight anymore. He quit in terms of he stopped trying. Um, going to you first, Gail. Uh, how surprised were you? It not that end of one, but the manner in which he won and how easily he wiped out uh, Ricky Burns. Yeah, when you when you hear any scorecard, even one out of the three judges that gives you a 120 to 108, whoa, I mean, most judges can find at least a round or two for the loser. Not, not in that card, and that, so that, that certainly gets your attention. You know, this was a fight where we all wanted to know, was in Dongle, you know, a contender or a pretender? Was the knockout of Trinovsky, you know, a lucky shot, that, that one lucky shot, you know, any fighter can have um, with the right place punch, you know, when all the stars align, you know, we see that stuff. And then sometimes they go back to, you know, whatever their real style and, you know, the, the water sell, settles at its level. But it was so interesting to see him be equally dominant in a fight. The clear winner, no question, just as much as he, he laid Burns on the ground in a completely different way. And that shows us he's got the skills, he is a real deal, and that's what we all wanted to know. So now everybody should be damned interested in where he's going from here. He is worth watching. We know he can win in different ways. And you're right. Burns helped him. You know, I call that the standing no moss. You know, <laughs> you get to a point in the fight and think, screw it. I'm losing. I don't need to quit, but I don't really want to get hit, and I don't want to try. So they just kind of tune out. You know, they go through the motions just to get to the final bell so that they didn't 
you know, they don't show that they quit. They don't show a stoppage. Um, but come on, everybody knows that you've just checked out. And that's a shame. Nobody, you know, if you're going to quit, do the manly thing and just say, I'm done. But that's what we get. He's got a lot of possibilities. You know, he's sort of an open player on the market. And there are a lot of people who could put him up against, you know, some of the better guys in the division. I mean, he's got a lot of options. And who wouldn't love to see him against Terrence Crawford? Come on. Oh, we will talk about that in a bit. Uh, Daniel, we talked about uh, this uh, a lot on um, EJ Boxing Live on his uh, channel um, over the weekend. So I'll go to you uh, last, but I'll, go to, but I'll go to you, Jacob, right now. Um, one, were you able to watch the fight? Have you, or have you seen it since um, after its conclusion? If you have, uh, your analysis of the manner of the ease in which um, and, and Dogo um, defeated Ricky Burns. Yeah, um, you know, I think Gail kind of hit it on the head. Um, for the most part, I mean, I was really impressed with Ndongo, and you know, to me, he, he, he proved that he belongs at this level. Um, you know, he's got a good win against Burns. Um, Burns just couldn't seem to, I don't know, he seemed to try, but he couldn't put, put it together, and I don't know if just maybe the awkwardness of, of the styles of Ndongo, Ndongo um, bothered him a lot. Um, you know, Ndongo is a kind of a lengthy fighter and he's, he's kind of crafty in a way. So, um, was I surprised that it was as, as wide as it was, as far as a, like a shutout? Uh, yeah, it was, I thought it would be a, a little bit more competitive, but, uh, you know, that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. I mean, uh, maybe, you know, Burns just is at the end of his career and Dongo is, is kind of on the rise. Uh, I'll, I'll go to you, Daniel. Sorry, I had to mute you, but I had some background noise on, on your end. Um, like I said, we we talked about this fight a lot on EJ Boxing Live's channel. Um, we will kind of uh, continue that discussion um, here. Uh, analysis of Ndogo's win over Burns. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Well, the issue that the issue that I thought was going to be is what we're going to see just. And before the fight, were we going to see just a flat-out puncher try to take out Burns early? Or were we going to see a patient in Duncan? We, you know, we got option B, and we got a very good option B. Not only did Dongo kept distance for Ricky Burns with the jab, he also maintained the left hand well enough where Ricky Burns tried to come in. He deterred him. He did throw real good shots to the body. And it just seemed like he knew he knew when to hurt Ricky Burns, but he knew when not to go overboard. Because that was the thing. When we knew him with Tornowski, we figured to him to be a puncher. And when you think of him as a when you think of punchers, you think, okay, once you hurt him, we're gonna this they need to blitz, then to get him out. And Donald kept patience enough where he knew enough of poverty or his team knew enough of Ricky Burns where if you try to make it in, if you try to go into it into a ball, you give Ricky Burns chances. And he kept his pace throughout. Now Burns had moments, but I I can't I can't disagree with that 120 108 scorecard. And Dongle just maintained ring generalship in such a way that Burns just looked flat out lost in a way. It it, like I said, it wasn't as pretty as Lomachenko was just more efficient in a way and in a conventional way now and like I said like Jacob mentioned we don't know if this is mainly Ricky Burns getting on and then Dango rising the fact of the matter these two are not really that they were not really that far apart in age it may just be a case where in like I said when Dango luckily has been kept in Nambia away from world competition, but now we're seeing him in world competition, and he's the goods in a lot of ways. Now, granted, yeah, Ricky Burns has been to wars. So Ray Beltran rearranged his face at one point. But it was it was just a flat-out outclassing in a way. 
I said it wasn't as pretty with Lomachenko that to Sosa because Lomachenko embarrassed Sosa. This was just Ndongo just outclassing in a conventional sense Ricky Burns. And like I said, it really surprised me because part of me thought he was going to try to get him out as soon as he thought he heard him. But maintain poise, maintain the game plan, and it showed that, in, that Ndongo's a pretty tough fighter to beat. Southpaw, lanky, could probably fill out, probably do well to wait at some point. And yeah, there's unfortunately the IBF is gonna make it a real is gonna make it almost impossible right now to make a unification fight with Crawford immediately. But that's the fight at 140. There's nothing else. Yeah, to your point, uh it looks like uh uh the IBF is going to make um, and don't go fight the mandatory. I, for, I, I forget uh, the guy's name. My apologies for that. But uh, assuming he fight, he gets that mandatory and wins. Or even if he finds a way to to, to bypass the mandatory, maybe pay a little step aside money. I was saying, Daniel, to finish your point, I just go to Gail and Jacob to talk about it here. The future of of and don't go. Um, Bud Crawford, uh, dominant at 140 pounds, uh, universally recognized as one of the top three, five fighters, uh, pound for pound. Um, that being said, he's not alone now, given what we just saw from Indogo. So, and I've already heard some folks say that Dustin Indogo, with his height, with his southpaw stance, uh, with with the skills that he displayed against Burns um, and the power that we know of, I, I, I've heard Scullabutt saying that 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 uh, this guy would give Bud Crawford hell and wouldn't be surprised if Bob Aaron would find a way to uh, kind of avoid this guy without appearing that he's avoiding this guy. So uh, your thoughts on Indogo? And the possibility of fighting uh, the top dog at 140 pounds, uh, Terrence Crawford. And anybody can chime in and respond. We aren't going to see it right away, and nor should we. Uh, the the um, mandatory, uh, his IBF mandatory is uh, Sergei Lipinets, um, uh, of Kazakhstan. That gives Aram cover <laughs> for now, uh, and Crawford cover for now. Um, you know, Ndongo has certainly not uh, been afraid to go into the lion's den of his opponents and fight them where they live. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't be horribly surprising to see this fight be the substitute showcase fight uh, in June. Yeah, it's soon. Uh, but, you know, Ndongo looked good. He, he didn't take a lot of damage. He, he's seems fresh he could potentially fight again and maybe they put the fight in Kazakhstan at the World Expo now that we know that Golovkin will not be there so he he may get that fight in quickly uh, in that case then you need to get a dance partner for Terence Crawford to keep him busy and make some time and maybe this is a fight we see near the end of the year and Bob Arum in particular seems to like to add fights to the calendar right at the end of the year you know and kind of close out the year so that would not surprise me at all if something like that happened uh, there's there's some reasonable stepping stones that could take place uh, until we get to that point i don't think it has to be too long you know a lot of it also is how this whole thing with pacquiao is going to play out and you know is aram going to put pacquiao and crawford up together and you know, then you've got the Lomachenko wild card. I don't think Lomachenko's, you know, going to move up to Crawford's weight anytime soon. And he has said, you know, at that weight, he doesn't really know, you know how much of his skill set would move up with him. So we'll get to chew it over for a few more months. Uh, but I bet you you'll see Ndonko in the ring if they can make a deal with Lupinets and get that mandatory done right away. It might be pretty darn quick. He's riding a winning streak. He's hot right now. People are buzzing about him. It would be very, very smart for him to get right back in there as soon as he feels ready. And at age 34, um, it's not like he has uh, a lot of time 
um, to waste. He just got on the scene. Um, Jacob, your thoughts on the future of Ndongo and the possibility possibility of him fighting Crawford? If he doesn't get the opportunity to fight Crawford, where will he go outside of his mandatory? Um, I, I mean, I think the Crawford talks are probably a little bit too premature. Um, I mean, Crawford is just to me is just a different beast. And um, but I wouldn't put it past him that he would like to take this fight. I mean, because you know he would be unifying. You know, he has two titles right now. He can unify uh, this one. So I mean, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past him. But you know, get a mandatory uh, done there, and and I think you know in time we can see what happens. Um, I just don't think he's ready for it, but he, I mean, he, he seems very excited and just very pumped up to, to be fighting. And, and I agree with Gail in the sense that, and I say it a lot, is that these guys got to stay active. I mean, there's, I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. There's, you can be in the gym for two years or you can be fighting in the ring and it's two totally different things. Um, I think the experience and the, uh, and what you get in the ring versus what you can do in, in sparring and all that, uh, it's just, it's worlds apart. And I like my fighters to be active and especially uh, someone like Ndongo who's, who, um, you know, again, isn't a spring chicken, but uh, isn't old either. Uh, in, in years, you know, when it comes to sports, it really depends on how hard of fights that you have or how much damage you've taken on how much, you know, wear is on the tires. You know, somebody that goes through wars and wars, you know, they're not going to last long. Hence, maybe someone like Fernand, uh, Francisco Vargas, who went through three hellacious fights, and you know maybe you know he won't last as long in the sport if he keeps on doing things like that. Um, but you know, someone like Ndongo, who's you know finishing these fights or is not getting hit a lot, you know maybe he, he can go a little bit further. But against Crawford, you know that that's a that's a tough task for anybody. Uh, Daniel, it's tough in a way because obviously, like he. One thing that Eddie Hearn was able to get as part of making this fight is having an option on Ndongo's next fight. And he's already talking about him facing people like Anthony Corrala, making Anthony Corrala go to 140. The IBF situation is what makes it tricky. Since we know the IBF, for all intents, we like it or love it, are probably one of the one of the sanctioning bodies that actually enforces the mandatories on a consistent basis. And in all sense of the word, that's probably going to be where he has to go. Now, obviously, that World Expo needs a new little headliner fight with a Triple G waiting for Canelo. And so Lipnitz, Lipnitz and Dango make sense. Like I said, and Dango only fought in December. Nice fighting in March, uh, in April. He didn't take much of a beating, so you could do a fight in June. You could keep him very, very active, and you could get the mandatory out of the way where... Meanwhile, you can make the fight probably with Crawford. That's the case, yeah, near the end of the year, like October, November, which for top ranks, for top ranks money probably makes more sense because then you could probably do the passing of the torch fight between Crawford and Pacquiao in 2018. Meanwhile, you give you give Bud a chance to do something that Manny is not, Manny is not able to do. Not many people have been able to do for a while, which is completely unified division. It all depends, though, on what Ndong is going to do, because there's talk that he wants to Crawford fight, and he's willing to vacate the IBF to get it. But then it robs Bud of the chance to do what I just said, because then another belt's going to be out there, then he has to chase Lipnitz. So it's going to be tricky, could be mainly because of Eddie Hearn. They might drop the IBF in order to make a big fight with Kuala just for the hell of it. It would be stupid, but it, it would make Kuala fight for the WBA belt. I won't 40 since he can't win the lightweight anymore. I wouldn't advise it, but if it makes money for Eddie Hearn, it's probably going to be the way to go. There's, so. there's a go point, ahead. though, to be made with, um, so isn't a Brook was with Hearn also, correct? Brooke is still with Hearn, in a way. Right, but he didn't drop his belt, IBF belt, I believe. 
because, you know, he didn't want to. So, I mean, I know Eddie Hearn's going to try to make money and, and, you know, do what he has to do. But if he's representing these fighters and they want certain things, you know, maybe he'll, you know, maybe he'll do what you uh, trying to make that big fight with uh, Crawford. Just the like issue Crawford, though, you know, made the fight with Spence. The issue though, Jacob, is the fact that Eddie Hearn is not really in Dongo's promoter. They just maneuver to just get an option in this next fight. With their thought being most likely that, oh, if Ricky Burns beats him, we can just feed him to Anthony. We can get in Dongo with Anthony Corolla to get Anthony Corolla acclimated to 140 pounds. Beating Burns in the way that he did throws that almost completely out the window. But it, it's whatever makes it whatever makes him money. The logical fight is Crawford. But the IBF being the IBF, we're gonna most likely see Lipnitz. Well, the the IBF has ordered Lipnitz. You know whether money gets passed around to shuffle the cards. Didn't you know? they have a purse bid or something that's going to happen um, next week? Yep, like they made it that quick. They're not even giving. Yeah, they went. Chance. They went right after it. You know, all due credit to them. They. They've put this in play quick. You know, I, I mean, for my money, I wouldn't mind seeing him against somebody like, I mean, this would be a, you know, sort of a uh, make work fight, but put him against somebody like Adrian Granados. And we certainly that's see what he look. was made of. Uh, that, that's a good. What, it would. That's a good look. Bring him here to the United States. Uh, put the fight on. Put it. Put it on a big undercard. You know, yeah. don't make it the main event. Put it on a. You know, make it a solid undercard fight on something that's already getting attention, and you use that fight to introduce him to the American audience, who's then eventually going to see him against Crawford. You don't want to put him in cold. You know, only gear boxing gearheads like us know who he is right now. The general American boxing public does not. So they need to get well, a look. Put him on a, yeah, either put him on the undercard of a, uh, of a big show and then of a show box card. Yeah, you could, well, yeah, you could do that. You're going to want him, well, yeah, that's going to be the interesting part, being that Crawford's an HBO fighter. You're going to need to put him on a boxing after dark or something like that. Which can so, be, yeah. it can be done. Eddie Hearn, mm -hmm. Eddie Hearn is not exclusive to Showtime. He will make fights at HBO if he has to. So yeah, yeah, he it's an, certainly would. Yeah, the the point though is is it's going to be in Dongo's pride is probably going to play this into it. Is he going to just go for the big money now, or is he want is he going to want to be a fighting champion in the way and defend his belts? I don't know much about this mandatory, but um, I would say get that out the way just to do so. Um, I, I'm, I'm being presumptuous here, but I'm going to assume that 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 Ndongo is better than the mandatory. Um, again, like I said, I haven't seen much of him, uh, but for me, I would say get him get that out the way um, as quickly as possible. Um, then the doors for any and everything at 140 or even 147 can open up. Um, if folks are serious about an Ndongo, Crawford about, um, give some time to build that fight up. Unless, again, unless Aram decides to take a different route, all of a sudden seeing what he saw in Glasgow, you may want to try to push, uh, Managed to get in the ring with Crawford, but if not, yeah, um, that is that that is the fight right now at 140 pounds. Let's move on. Oh wow! To um, oh, uh, what happened? In, uh, what, my, I, I, I just saw this. Apparently, mm -hmm. it the move is for Ndongo to vacate, and apparently, we're it looks like it's shaping up to be Lipnets versus Maurice Hooker. For vacant for the vacant IBF one hundred and forty pound. Yeah. That's kind of a dip. Uh, Lipinets or Indongo? 
There's no, also yeah, there's a report, there is a report also floating around about putting Indongo and Maurice Hooker on the Kovalev Ward 2 undercard. And, you know, Hooker was on, on the undercard of the first Kovalev Ward fight. Eh, not the greatest performance, not the worst. Um, you know, and he's got a title to fight for. It's a quick comeback. But mm -hmm. oh, it's um, a quick turnaround. But you know, when you win one twenty to one hundred eight, <laughs> and the clock's ticking, like you. and you're thirty four years old, you know, you claim you're thirty four. And as we were talking about here on the side chat tonight, you know, is he really thirty four, or is he like a Luis Ortiz thirty four? You know, <laughs> and he's really thirty eight. We don't know. It wasn't like uh, Burns gave him a lot of punishment in this bout. So yeah, uh, I could see that quick turnaround fight. This fight with Hooker. And I like it when guys do this. They yeah. need to seize the initiative when they've got when they've got momentum like this and the name is being spoken. Do it now. Your chance might pass. Yeah. Yeah, give give them some visibility. Um do that. Maybe HBO is impressed by what they see. Uh HBO decides to invest in him in a little bit, put him on an after dark show against the mandatory. And then bother, and then try to promote across, again a crop. I tell you what, they would love to have a decent fight on that Kovalev two, you know, Kovalev War two because they didn't have much on the first fight. So you know, if Indongo and Hooker can put on a show, uh, you know, they're going to be very favorably disposed to telling the promoters, you know, we really like to see him again. Indeed, indeed. So uh, let's move on. Um, Uncasville, Connecticut. Uh, Sullivan Barrera fought Paul Parker. Uh, Parker gave him a, a little bit of problems early on, but the uh, power of Barrera showed his way through, knocked Parker down multiple times, um, taking him out in round five. Um, I'll just go around anybody who wants to discuss it for anybody who's thought about uh, your impressions. Did you get much out of it or is it just on to the next for Barrera? It's on to the next for Burr because of the sequence of the way it ended and what happened preceded it. Because it looked like Barker didn't, re he never really recovered from, it looked like a combination from a punch right above the ear and a headbutt at the same time. And his equilibrium just wasn't the same afterwards. Now, Granted, this was this was a fight that Sullivan was supposed to was supposed to win, so he did win it. But it does put him in a little bit of a row where he's he's now just fought two prospects in a row. And unfortunately, one of my fears with Barrera is he's not going to get he's probably not going to get the shot at trying to get a belt, and they're just going to put him with prospects. Like they're just talking, I think of. And putting fighting Vostick now. That's three straight prospects. He's essentially almost by default becoming a gatekeeper. Yeah, Pereira did what he needed to do, and he he's staying relatively busy. You know, he didn't wait six months off his um, win in December, and he needs to do exactly what we've just advised Ndongo to do. And what every fighter should do, unless they've had a rough go and, and they're on the upward trajectory and they're increasing the level of competition, get back in there as soon as you are physically and mentally able to do it. That's what he needs to do. And I, and I do think Kathy Duba will make that happen. She's very happy with him and you know, she, she's looking to advance his career as much as possible. Um, any thoughts, Jacobs, if you saw the fight? Yeah, I mean, um, it was what Daniel said before, just what, just another fight. Um, I mean, I really wish we would have saw that uh, fight that was being talked about against, uh, what's his face? Uh, yeah, damn, better be of. Um, but that seemed to fall through. Um, I think there's some fights out there for him. Uh, but I'll also remember... Barrera, if I'm not mistaken, was with um, uh, Glovkin, uh, Abel Sanchez. They had a split, 
after the Ward fight, and you know he's won all his fights since. I mean, he's only lost to you know the unit, you know, one of the best uh, pound for pound and uh, light heavyweight champion right now. But I mean, he can, you know, there's the winner, Fonfara Stevenson. There's Joe Smith. There's, you know, maybe the the loser or the winner of uh, Ward Kovlev. Um, there's still better be a, there's, there's a lot of, I think, uh, action or a lot of fights that you could potentially get. Um, I think especially if Kovalev loses, then they're both promoted by main events. Um, actually, I was at the fight where uh, Barrera, uh, basically maintained his number one uh, status for the IBF. Um, even though Kovalev wouldn't have the belt anymore, I mean, that's a makeable fight for um, uh, Kovalev because they're, you know, again, both main event fighters. So I, I think he, had, he has a, a few few more options than, than most. Um, and, you know, the division is still, you know, has a lot of uh, heat on it. So um, hopefully, you know, he stays in the ring and, and he's able to uh, get his promoter to make those fights. Uh, you mentioned a lot at 175. Um, all those fighters, let's not forget uh, Gvozdik either, who we talked about last week. Uh, seems, is another light heavyweight on the scene, Dmitry Bivol. Um, I don't know if any of you guys saw this fight. He fought um, in Oxon Hill, um, the site of, of, of the triple header on HBO a couple weeks back uh, 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 with um, um, Lomachenko and the cruiserweight um, Usek um, and the aforementioned Gvozdik. Um, Bivol fought Samuel Clarkston, stopped him in four. Um, I haven't seen the fight. I don't know if you guys have, but from what I've read, he looked very good. Um, he's in line, I believe, for a shot, maybe against um, Cleverly. Uh, yes, Cleverly uh, is the mandatory for him now. But for those who, was, who saw the fight, your impressions of uh, Dimitri Bivol? I did see it. He was on Showbox card. Uh, at National Harbor the week after the Ukrainian triple dream team <laughs> had had their um, uh, outing. And, you know, he's one of these Eurasian, Eastern European fighters. Um, he is extremely economical and accurate with his punches. He, when he throws, he hits the target. That's what's so impressive about him. To say that he punches like a mule, you know, is another <laughs> fine point. But he, he's just extraordinarily accurate, you know. It's, it's, it's like launching, you know, uh, it's like an expert at a video game, you know, launching missiles. Boom, boom, boom. Everything hits. His numbers were just incredibly impressive. And somebody that can be that economical, you know, all their energy can be focused on output that get you somewhere, you know, that, that's the ideal situation. So very impressive outing. And, you know, it, it would be interesting to see him against somebody as veteran as Cleverly, you know, likely to pull every trick out of the hat and make him think a little bit more. You know, this was a guy, Clarkson, you know, fairly easy to figure out, you know, what wasn't, all that difficult to aim at that particular target. Cleverly would be a different story. Now, if he could do anywhere close to what he did last Friday, then we, like in Dongo, you know, that would be the test to find out, you know, do we have a real deal in front of us or not? But it was a great introduction to the boxing public. Um, I'll go to you, uh, Daniel and Jacob, if you saw the fight. Uh, your comments on the fight, and, and how would you compare uh, Bival to uh, Gvastik. How would you compare him to uh, Bertabiv and the uh, other up-and-coming um, um, light heavyweights in the world? I, I, caught, I caught most of the end of the fight. Gvastik tries to do a little bit more combinations. You can tell he's a little bit more aggressive. So B-ball tends to be a little bit more economical. He's a bit more like Bietabev in that way. And they both can hit, and they both can crack. The thing about it, and they mentioned, I think is, was I think it was very Tompkins and mentioned, weird. He's just the latest in the law, and a seemingly almost endless line of Eastern European or Eurasian light heavyweights that can crack, are good, sound technically, and can, and can keep their poise throughout the fight. Now. 
Cleverly is going to present a little bit of a problem because Cleverly luckily has a good hand of experience with him. And he's been in some wars with people that can crack. Probably the thing with Bivol is going to be how is he can turn the hand of somebody that is as crafty as him because he has been mostly, like I said, he's been mostly a showbox guy, fighting prospects. Cleverly is his first fringe world-class guy that is going to want to face him. And it's going to show a lot what he's going to do because the way he's shaping up, these guys are going to wind up facing each other before they get to the top. Now you just thought that they just had two two weeks in a row where you just had this menu at the MGM in Maryland, and it looks to be a pretty, really, really sizable crowd each time now for these Eurasian fighters. So there might be a chance you might see Bivol versus Vostik or Bivol versus Bietevet. Before they before they get a chance to crack to get crack at the top, which obviously is obviously still Ward, Kovalev, and Stevenson. Well, uh, Jacob, I was going to say, Jacob, your impressions of the fight, if you were able to uh, uh, catch it. I didn't catch it. Um, mm -hmm. I saw the other three main fights, but I didn't catch up. Okay, you were going to have you had a comment, Gail? Uh, yeah. Um. You know, I. I don't think they'll put him toward, I don't think they'll aim it at Gavostik, not yet. Uh, I, I think that would be, you know, it's the whole styles make fights. I, I think those two would just, you know, blast each other. <laughs> I don't know no, if they really want to put either of them through the ringer like that. Um, better be a, this would be a very interesting contest and, and totally agree with Daniel. Like I said, cleverly, who is mandatory in theory, presents a different style for him that he does need to test himself with. So that's really a good, that's a good fit. It's, it's the perfect opponent at this point of his career. And we need to see, you know, how much gas does cleverly have in the tank? I mean, there are a lot of interesting questions to answer in a fight like that. So would love to see it. I'm really pleased on the other, uh, on another side note to see how well this new venue, the National Harbor, MGM National Harbor is doing. It's basically in the Metro Washington DC area, you know, and except for, you know, the old um, uh, DC Armory. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. <laughs> it's kind of a interesting old school joint. You know, there really hasn't been a good boxing venue in the greater Washington DC area for a long time. So it's a wonderful addition. It only seats, it's a, just a, sh a hair under 3000. And it is so much better to get these guys in front of a packed house of 3000 instead of a half empty house of 5000 in a place that seats, you know, 11,000 people. It's just healthy for boxing. It's exciting. It's getting people to the fights. You know, I think the tickets are relatively affordable and you're going to be able to develop fan base with some of these guys for people who probably in many cases are seeing boxing live for the first time. It's great. It's just great for boxing. Um, I'm going to disagree with you, Kiel, because, you know, these little places are taken away from my West Coast fights. So <laughs> <laughs> We got the stub hub though. Let's not be, I know, but let's not be we're, in, we're in April. <laughs> We're in April, and this is the first fight that we've had on the West Coast. <laughs> it's the like beginning it's of a long... Jacob, have patience, my I'm son. The it's the beginning of a long, hot summer, man. We're going to have a good yeah. time. Yeah, you got to let us East Coast guys. It, 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 yeah, we got to share. Come hey, on. You, guys, you guys have the Barclays. Come on. <laughs> that's, been, that's been popping off. No, but but no, but that's cool. not one of these nice you know, modest-sized venues built, really, really built well for boxing. You know, the more the merrier. Come on. Yeah. I'm just being greedy. I'm just messing yeah. up. <laughs> you got to get enough now. Stop being greedy. <laughs> <laughs> Man, listen, I just want venues down here in the South. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> well, you know what? Point well taken. Honest to God. You know what? What the hell? You've got a really solid base of guys fighting out of Florida. Why is there not a venue to accommodate that? Why not? 
in Miami, it, the, the part of it when Miami becomes very difficult is there's because American Airlines Arena is booked for a lot of things. It's one of the reasons why the Miami Heat has not hosted a has not hosted an All Star game in the whole time that they've done it. Is because they have a steady stream of schedule of things that are happening that are almost one right after the other, one after the other, one after the other, that doesn't do a schedule change. Now, that might change, though, because they're doing they're, they're redoing the convention center, I think, in Miami Beach. And that has always been a good goal to get a menu in, to get some of the Cuban fighters out, and to get some of the guys like you see in the backyard fights, to put them in there and do legitimate fights. That's Miami. I, I I don't know what is going on in Tampa, Orlando, and I pretty much count Jacksonville as Georgia. So <laughs> it's right. Georgia's part. Right, right. But but it, you would think those would make more sense. You know, there's tons of airline traffic in and out of those, you know, especially the Orlando area. And convention Orlando has the biggest convention center in the entire United States by by trade show square footage. And you you couldn't you couldn't use a exhibit hall or two strung together for four thousand people. Of course you could. There's also the fact that it, it is the South. Uh, football does run Florida, in a way. Like a lot of the other, and it's one thing that's actually hurting. Like Keith Thurman is like one of the few and far between guys that really just excels at boxing now coming out of Florida. Everybody else is either trying to get trying to be a hurricane trying to be a seminole trying to be a gator unless you're cuban unless you're cuban and i'm looking at what the mexican american and and mexican community has done in southern california that could absolutely happen happen in boxing in florida with the cuban both nationals and expats who are here now that the borders are a little more fluid it would be nice to see that happen. And, and you have all, a whole, you know, load of Puerto Rican fighters, too. It needs to happen. You got Roy Jones. Oh, for God's sakes. Well, yeah, Roy Jones is kind of part of the panhandle. The, also, the thing with the Cuban fighters is there's a reason. It's not just one of Shields. There's a reason where Arizona Lara is in Houston instead of Miami. Unfortunately, with the Cuban community, you have to be full bore right. You have to be full bore anti Castro right wing in order to be fully accepted by that community. Right. Wow, to, to, right. to, to get the full support. And if you have a semblance of dissent, they abandon you. Politics. Yeah. Politics. They, I, I've seen yeah, I've seen it firsthand. That there's there's a reason why some of these guys don't get as big as they do because they it's it's it. Miami, oh, well, for chocolate, either Miami would be a perfect base. Miami not only has the biggest Cuban population, it has the biggest Nicaraguan population. Yeah, wouldn't that country. be interesting? Michael, we're trying to hook okay. a brother up. We're trying. <laughs> Strategizing, man. Keep working on it. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, let's, move on. let's move on to some news here. One main bit of news I want to focus uh, on. Uh, last week, we talked a lot about uh, the situation with Anthony Joshua. Uh, his upcoming defense against uh, Vladimir Klitschko and um, where it will be aired um, here in the U.S. Um, at the time, they were squabbling back and forth between HBO and Showtime, um, negotiating who would have the rights to air the bout live and you know, tape delay and whatnot. Um, a couple of days ago, an agreement has come uh, between HBO and Showtime. Uh, Showtime will air the bout live on the 29th, 4.15 Eastern. Um, HBO will air on tape delay, uh, 10 o'clock Eastern. Um, your reaction to this bit of news, and I'll just open up for anyone and everyone, um, your reaction to this. And um, Showtime basically finally got, got uh, head out their asses and um, come together in accord to uh, televise this uh, mega bout. Showtime's uh, kicking ass and taking names, man. Um, I think they deserve, in my opinion, to show this fight because they're putting more, in my opinion, 
putting more towards boxing than HBO is at the moment. And so, you know what? They're they're putting in the work and they're and they're creating the fights and you know they should be showing it. And HBO delusional if they think that I don't know that people aren't gonna watch it and and talk about it and all that stuff. But uh, I mean, I, I think HBO has a lot of problems and uh, they better fix it pretty fast or they're gonna become uh, second fiddle to Showtime if they're not already. Uh, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah, what happened is HBO more or less hold, held Showtime hostage until the nth minute so that Showtime got the minimum promotional time possible for, for the live version of the fight. They held up, they held up, they held up. They wanted to make sure they got them past their events last weekend before they said yes, which happened. And this is essentially the deal we've been hearing about for months. There were no surprises here, really. Uh, at all. Uh, HBO's objections were just time buying gimmicks. So now in the United States, you're going to see the fight live on Showtime. And then approximately six hours later, you're going to see it on HBO. HBO has worked with Klitschko and, and his promotion company, K2, which is also the promoter of Gennady Golovkin, among others. And they want to make sure they're playing nice with them. And they're they, HBO has kind of got to hedge its bets here. If Klitschko wins, they want to make sure they're, you know, paying lip service to this fight because then they're going to need to renegotiate for whatever series of fights Vladimir decides he's, you know, going to do before he calls it quits on the career. I mean, I certainly do not think if he wins, this is going to be his last fight. I mean, he's going to want to if Tyson Fury ever gets his completely raggedy ass together, which is certainly not a given, um, especially based on some of the pre-show discussion, which I don't know that we'll get into here. Look it up, folks. You can find it. Um, you know, they want to be in a position to have appeared supportive of Klitschko. Um, you know, and if he loses, you know, there still may be some things in play, but they have to give them the airtime. Now, the ideal scenario, wh whoever wins, is that it's a cracking good fight. You know, it's exciting. Uh, it's a quick knockout. It's some, there's some buzz from it. There's some kind of buzz that people are talking about, and that will cause the numbers to go up for HBO, if that's true. People will start talking social media will start buzzing and people will say, Hey, wow, really? Oh, I was out this afternoon. I want to see that. Cause let's not forget. It's very early in the day for a lot of people. It's a Saturday and you know, folks aren't always sitting on their ass at home, especially on the West coast at one o'clock in the afternoon, to watch a fight or four or happy hour on the East coast. So that HBO broadcast is going to capture, uh, you know, a certain percentage of the audience. And as long as the fight, isn't a complete stinker, blowout, boring as hell, then you know, it'll be interesting to see what the numbers are for each network and what the aggregate total is. You know, it is the heavyweight division. It's the guy that everybody's buzzing about. You know, we'll see how they draw. But th this was the only way they could split the baby. And, uh, you know, it's not the worst thing that two networks ever did. They'll, they'll be all right. I mean, they've done it before with uh, um, yeah. Lewis and Tyson. Um, yeah. So while it's not exactly on that yeah. level, still pretty damn big. Uh, but, to it was, but it was also in an era prior to social media, which really changes the equation. Because, you know, come on, guys, we all know. If we want to see a fight, we see it. Right. You know, there's ways. We know, how, we know how it goes. If you're yep. really motivated, you're going to see it. Yep. And, in, and with six hours to what go... What are you insinuating, Gil? Uh, oh, I, I'm not insinuating a damn thing. <laughs> Look, I, told you, I told you last week, uh, HBO was in, in Showtime was, didn't get the act together. I was going to see this fight come hell or high water, legal or illegal, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, so, uh, Daniel, your, your reaction to this? When I saw the way this shape that is, it's pretty much, like Gail said, this was pretty much the deal that they had when this fight was rumored to have been on December 10th, which is 
Showtime airs the fight live the first time. HBO airs the replay. And should there be a rematch, HBO gets to air it live first. And then Showtime shows the tape delay. It's pretty much essentially the same fight. There is a bit of tactics about it. Gilbert mentioned it. We, like when we talked about it last week, this fight was horrendously promoted in the U.S. because of this mess. And now, like I said, Showtime did as fast as they could a video package that they could to promote this fight, but it's not going to be nowhere near enough to do it because they're going to be focused on going to Barclays, and then they get, and then they're not going to have the chance to fully prep, at least the advertising people wise, the Mar Ronaldo, Al Bernstein, and Paul Menage will, because they're flying out to that fight. That was one of that was one of the big parts of the deal. It's once they're going to be oh Showtime Boxing International, and then HBO gets to re-air it. It's Showtime Championship Boxing. So you're going to have the main crew there, and they're going to see it live. And let's not and also one little tidbit of news. Luckily, let's not forget. One Mr. Deontay Wilder will now be in attendance. And he has stated he doesn't care who wins. He will call out the winner. So if the chance so happens that Klitschko beats Joshua, HBO and Showtime gonna have, are going to wind up doing this again. Because obviously with Wilder being with the PBC and... Let's go. Still being with HBO, they're gonna call through the same mess again, and it'll be a and it might be an even bigger fight because now it goes to the Madison Square Garden. It goes to the MGM Grand. If you're, if one can actually think, if one actually being smart, and if you want to play to Alabama's roots, you can put in that good old stadium where the Crimson Tide play. So that's going to turn out to be a hell of a, but it, it's true. It's true what Gail said. This, is, this was just a way to make sure that Showtime wasn't able to build up the fight and they get more chances. Like, I, I'll give you a good example of how HB pretty much did this. Yesterday was the new season premiere of the fight game. And HBO got a chance to preview that fight before Showtime did. And there, and Showtime's the one airing it live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what kind of numbers you think it will do um, on the live show, Showtime, versus uh, tape delay on HBO? It it, it depends who wins. It, to me, it depends who wins. If Joshua wins. You're probably going to see less numbers on HBO. If you see Klitschko win, I probably see a lot more numbers on HBO. Thoughts? I did. I disagree. I think it's kind of what Gail said before. If if it's an exciting fight, or there's a buzz or a big knockout, I think that helps HBO. But also, HBO has an advantage because they have more subscribers. So. Um, they're, I mean, they've always had that, that little bit of an advantage. Um, so I, I really think it depends on what type of fight it is. Because if it's like a uh, Klitschko theory fight, I think it's going to tank. Do you think Do you think that, and I, uh, you can uh, chime in, Gail. I apologize for interrupting. Um, do you think that social media could play a role in uh, getting more viewers particularly on the Showtime live uh, viewing, airing, excuse me. And what I mean by that is uh, a lot of buzz about this in boxing Twitter. That could extend over to mainstream sports Twitter. It, become, it could, be, could become a hot trending topic, which could attract uh, casuals, if you will, casual boxing fans, casual sports fans to tune in live. Uh, it, it will make all the difference, but only if it's a good fight. I mean, it is going to completely rest on the quality of the fight. So let's look at the numbers for these guys uh, prior to this in their last couple of fights. 
the Klitschko Fury fight, which was an afternoon fight on HBO, averaged just a hair over 1 million viewers. Not bad. Not too bad. Um, the, the fight between Joshua and Charles Martin, which was on Showtime, only averaged 275,000 viewers. Klitschko is still the bigger name and the bigger draw, which is interesting. It is really a potential changing of the guard, or not. We don't know. You know, I, I think the Showtime numbers will be better, and the HBO numbers will be worse than their last fight. How much worse? You know, it's going to be very hard to say. I, I do think the live broadcast being sorely in the afternoon uh, in the U.S. is going to stifle the audience. You're going to have a lot of people that say, ah, you know, I'll record it on my DVR or, or whatever, or I'll call it up, you know, uh, at some other point um, when I get home from whatever I'm out doing on Saturday afternoon. And if they hear the fights boring by a social chatter, they say, ah, well, okay, screw it, never mind, and I'm going out to dinner. Or they hear, man, it was crazy. Oh, wow, it was really wild. And Wilder got in the ring and called out so, you know, and all the buzz, whatever's got it. They'll say, ooh, I need to watch that. You know, HBO is going to serve it up to them on a silver platter. You know, I'm fine if everybody rides. And, you know, if we're at, if we, this is really not the kind of math, you know, anybody wants you to do, but if you take that 300,000 or so audience off, Joshua's last Showtime fight and that million or so that Klitschko drew and they both sort of draw down and you've got, you know, 400 or 500,000 in the afternoon for Showtime and 600,000 in the evening for HBO. It's all good. And, and that's my prediction. Ah, let's move on. Uh, talk about the start to run down the fights that's happening this weekend. A lot of action um, on, on, on the plate. Uh, Let's start with the Showtime card first. Uh, Sean Porter fighting Adrian Broner. Ad excuse me, excuse me. Sean Porter fighting um, Andre Berto. Got Adrian Broner on my mind and him and his uh, screw-ups, for, for those who do not know. Uh, arrested earlier today, I believe. Um, overnight. overnight. Overnight in Kentucky. Yeah. Um, his SUV was riddled with bullets. Uh, he was released on 503... Uh, three dollar bond, but still, it just speaks that uh, just speaks once again to the fact that Broner's uh, life is, in spite of what he says, his life is pretty much is is in chaos right now, and he just needs to sit down, just sit down and get his act together. It's about uh, bell bonds. I don't know what it's about, but he just like I said, he just needs to get his act together and um to quote Ian Levanzan, get his life in order. Um, he needs to go to reform school is what he needs to do. Something, something. Um, so yeah, Sean Porter fighting Adrian, uh, Andre Berto. Uh, Saturday night, Showtime and Showtime Extreme um, in NY. Uh, on paper, it looks to be an exciting bout. It should be a very good bout. I'm going with per Porter simply because at this point, Berto, given the tough fight that he's had over the years, I don't trust his legs. I don't know how much he really has left in spite of his last fight uh, that he won in exciting fashion. Um, again, I just don't much, I just don't trust, I just don't know how much he truly has in the tank. Um, Jacob, your thoughts? Um, I agree. I, I think, uh, you know, Berto is as exciting as a knockout that he had it was again let's take it for what it is it was against uh victor ortiz um and you know he has flashes of of our moments but I, in my opinion he doesn't he doesn't throw enough punches and he's very tentative um i think sean porter um as how do i say this as a uh, kind of sometimes raw as he is or just kind of wild as he is I think he still has the, the better skills and he's got a hell of a chin and um, he'll put the pressure on and he's going to, he's going to try to break him down. And I, I think, you know, Porter wants, there's more at stake for Porter. He, he, um, he's up there at the top 
and uh, you know he had some close fights, uh, uh, both decision losses. But I think he wants to get you know get a, a second chance at Thurman and and uh, you know get some of these bigger fights. So uh, Berto, you know, he's kind of towards his I think in the end of his career, um, in my opinion. Uh, uh, Daniel and Gail. It's, it's this has been built as a crossroads fight for both, but it is more of a crossroads for Berto because Porter for Porter has faced a better caliber of opponents over the past than Berto has, and has done fairly better no matter no matter the actual caliber or no matter how it ended. He just looked better, and even if there were losses, like with Thurman. And with Brooke, that's still Keith Thurman and Kel Brooke, two world champions at welterweight. Whereas Roberto, we've seen him face with, like I said, like said with, which granted he was with one arm, still lose a fight pretty easily against Soto Caras. And that ultimately details, I think those, a lot of the fights that he was in, like the fight with Ortiz in 2011, particularly that fight in 2011, it took something out of Berto that he's never really been able to gain back. And with this being a WBC eliminator, it puts more of the onus on Berto because it, it's really now his last shot at getting in line for a title shot. Because obviously, like I said, WBA, Thurman holds, and Lamont Peterson is in front of him for that. The IBF is going to be with Spence, and I don't think I don't think Virgil Hunter is mad enough where he even suggests fighting Spence with Roberto. And obviously the WBO is with Manny, so that's not so that fights so that shots out the window completely. This is his, really his last chance now. For Porter, for Porter, it guess it gets him. It gets him one step closer to rematching Thurman, which act, and it puts the PBC in a weird situation. Do you put Thurman first against Peterson, or you put him against Porter? Because obviously, if you put him against Porter, it's a rematch of a dark horse for fight of the year. If you put him against Peterson, you fulfill the WBA mandatory. And not to mention that Peterson is a type of fighter that even if he loses, he's going to make you work for it. So it's an interesting dynamic. Like I said, it's another one of those fights where at the TV, at least the TV packages work well, but locally I have not heard one iota about this fight. Locally. And this is happening, like I said, this is happening in two days. I heard more about Serrano. I mean, Serrano and the chance for her to break Cotto's record than I've heard about that. Well, oh, and Serrano would not be on the televised portion of the card if it wasn't for Luis Ortiz backing out. She, her fight was elevated. So thank you, Luis. I, <laughs> I agree. This is, you know, this is Porter's fight. Um, you know, having seen Berto uh, fighting Victor Ortiz, that was just, I mean, he won and he won decisively. And this might sound strange. And I'm trying to recall, Jacob, if you were there, it was a stub hub fight. Of course I was. Of course you were. Don't you think, even though Berto won, he should have won. Berto, yeah. Berto won, but he should have won even more decisively than he did. Ortiz was that bad. But Ortiz, you know, hung in there for longer than, you know, he really should have. But Ber Berto did, you know, Berto did end the fight. Oh, Berto got knocked I just down don't... early in that fight. And he did. Well, he, he definitely got popped, flash knocked down. It did not hurt him, but he did get caught. Well, that's... That's Victor Ortiz. <laughs> he, 
he, that, he will be popping right back off his butt if Porter hits him the same way. And, and I think he will. I mean, Mayweather toyed with him like he was, you know, a dead mouse with a cat. It was ugly. And he's, I really, unfortunately, think this is going to be a I'm collecting a paycheck fight because he's done it before. And I mean, Berto. I think Porter's got this. And yeah, then it does send up an interesting situation. Um, I think personally, Thurman should fight Peterson. And Thurman has shown himself willing to take on anybody. And then you line up that Porter. Except Spence. Anybody, except Errol, Spence. Errol, 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 anybody except Errol Spence. Well, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Well, that, you know, that's the one, that's the, that's the shining fight on the hill that we all want to see. I'd like to see him take all these steps to get there and, you know, may the best man win. Uh, most intriguing bout on this card, Charles Hatley, Jamel Charlo, controversy heading in is in, in that uh, Hatley, who is Charlo's number one contender, right now signed a, a file of suit. Against his promoter Don King. Uh, for those who may not know, Hatley and Charlo had a run-in before. Uh, after Ch Jamel's brother Jamal uh, defeated uh, Julian J.R. Williams, um, Hatley uh, bum rushed the ring and had a little dust up with both of these with both uh, uh, Charlo brothers. Uh, I'll go to you first, Daniel. Um, the backdrop of the lawsuit coming in. Um, how good is Hatley really? given how he lost, I believe, to an early round stoppage. Um, your thoughts on this bout? It's an interesting fight because Hadley's a pretty decent opponent Yeah, for Jermel. Because, one of it, well, the Charlo brothers are in a way a little bit more like the Darrell brothers. One of them has the dog in him. The other one has the better skill in him. As far as skill... Well, what I would say is not necessarily the dog. The, uh, one of them um, is more talented skill-wise, while the other one, uh, uh, Jamal specifically, is not that he's not skilled. It's the, it's the fact that he is very, very strong, and he really has pop. That puts yeah, him over the top. That, that's the thing, yeah. Like, I wouldn't say like he has a dog in him, though. Well, I had a little bit of reverse when it came to, like, the better skill is, is Jamal just based – on raw skill, but when it comes to power, it is Jamal. And obviously size, it is Jamal. But it presents a different dynamic where Jamal has to find a different way to win. And we've seen we've seen how he won the title. He had to will himself back to win and he took the chance that was given to him. He has to, it has to be the same way in this fight. I said that look uh, we know that early round stoppage going into it, but it may be one of those losses, like well, now when I would look at hindsight with with Jacobs and Pirog, where, okay, it was a one shot, but now we know what Danny Jacobs is. We're going to see now what Hatley's going to be. And for Jamal, it's going to be another one of these fights where he has to, as the fight gets in, find the openings that he needs to, he needs to find to land a good combination and try to end the fight as early, try to end the fight as early as possible because like I said, with with Jamal now out of the division and you no longer being in the same gym as Laura, there is no excuses when it comes to unification fights. It doesn't matter if Hurt is as, is as green as grass. You need to take that fight. You need to start making unification fights. Because there's no excuse now. If he wins. Now, if Hatley wins, it's an even more open window. But it's about time this division gets with the unifications going. And like I said, since Jamal left, the one big excuse is now out the window. Uh, Gail and uh, Jacob. Go ahead, 
Sorry about that, uh, toggling the mic there. Um, not, not a lot more to add except that, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how long this Charlo brother stays at 154 when his twin brother's at 160. You know, I mean, uh, we've got one guy who says, I can't make 154 anymore. I mean, straight up, I can't, and moved up and abandoned a belt to do it. And yet his, his twin is, you know, here he is. He's at 154. Now, it doesn't mean just because they're twin brothers that, you know, they have exactly the same work habits, exactly the same metabolism, but, you know, closer match than most. How long is he going to stay at 154? It's an interesting question, you know, and how, how long he stays may depend on, you know, what kind of goods are dangled in front of him. And if they aren't worth the sacrifice it takes him to stay at 154, maybe he moves up too. And I actually think he will. Well, it depends on um, if we finally see Triple G Canelo and who wins. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, say, they finally fight, uh, Triple G wins, and then he vacates and moves up to 68 leaving the belts vacant. If Canelo wins, uh, he's going to stay in that division for the foreseeable future. And I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's in his best move to move up because I don't know if he'll get the shot if Canelo beats uh, Triple G. Well, it definitely yeah. opens up the division and you, and you know who thinks he can beat Canelo, you know, if Canelo wins, it's Jamal. David Lemieux. Well, David Lemieux, but also, yeah. You got Jamal, he wants that shot first against Canelo. Well, and, and let's, you know, we can't forget that, you know, really your heir apparent, despite his loss, is Danny Jacobs. Yes. So, yeah, no, it makes it very, it all makes it very interesting. These are two really interesting, busy divisions, and there's going to be a changing of the guard here in the next 12 months. Uh, your thoughts on this, uh, Jacob? Your thoughts on this fight, Jacob? I actually, I, I do think that Jermel is, is the better skilled fighter of the brothers. And I think he's going to put it together and come out in an impressive performance. Um, I don't think he's going to move just yet. Uh, I think with the relationship he has with his brother and what he's trying to accomplish. I mean, they, they did something where they both held divisions or both held titles in the same division, you know, so great, you know, something accomplished. But I think, you know, with uh, Jamal's uh, move um, of recent after that spectacular win, you know, I think he's going to let his brother stay there and he'll, he'll uh, stay um, in his division or stay in his lane and, Hopefully they'll try to get you know these big fights and and um, maneuver around them to, to both have be champions and then maybe later down the line uh, uh, he moves up and maybe even Jamal moves up another uh, another division if he accomplishes uh, what he wants at that division. Um, on the uh, final fight on this card, well, final fight we're going to talk about here, um, Amanda Serrano, and we're going to talk some women's boxing in here. Set to make some history or trying to make some history, I should say, trying to win a world title in, in her fifth division, fifth weight division. Uh, she's going to fight um, Diana Santana um, on this card. Uh, I'll go to you, Gail, first. Uh, your thoughts on um, Serrano trying to make history fighting for the um, Bantamweight title? I love it. I love the ambition. Good for her. Um, women's boxing's having a moment. It's really smart for these women to seize that. And she is going to be on the Showtime card because Luis Ortiz bailed out due to injury. So she's getting her you know, moment. Um, and it's you know, quite an accomplishment if she can do it. And what's interesting is she's currently the super bantamweight champion. She's held, she's held titles in four divisions with super bantamweight being the highest. And now she's going to the Bantamweight title, which she should win. 
she should win. And that will make her, uh, she, she's currently tied with Miguel Cotto at four. She'll be the first to reach five for any professional boxer, male or female, out of Puerto Rico. And in a fight crazy nation like that, that's huge. She has a, a really solid following. And I think the American public, you know, the more they see her, you know, she's, she's in a lot of ways carrying the banner for women's boxing out of the East Coast versus the group that's out of the West Coast. Um, Clarissa Shields will be there, which should be very interesting. Uh, and we were all watching a rather interesting Twitter war with her last night. So women's boxing is on the map right now. And it, it, all, all the women who are very ambitious in the sport, now's the time. They, they are taking every possible opportunity coming to them. Uh, we're not seeing a whole lot of discussion in women's boxing about so-and-so ducking that other person and promoter issues. And no, there's none of that. You know, and admittedly, it's a different playing field. But um, some of the guys could learn a little something from that. Should be a good scrap. Is, is Shields going to be at that fight or at the stub hub to support Shakur? Uh, Shakur Stevenson is at StubHub. Amanda Serrano will be on the... No, no, but I thought, she'll, I thought she tweeted out that she's going to be at... Oh, you're right. Clarissa's going to be at StubHub. Pardon me. Yes. She's not going to be at uh, uh, Serrano's fight. Pardon me. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, but yeah, women's, women's boxing has a momentum that is really unprecedented. It's right there. Uh, there's enough personalities. There's enough athletic excellence on display you know uh, they really do fight much more like the men than they used to and there is movement toward making the women's fights three minute rounds um, the athletic commission in new jersey has okayed three minute rounds for the women nicola adams in great britain is going to fight three minute rounds in her next bout it will happen and if that doesn't become the standard this year it's months away if that it's good for good 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 for women's boxing indeed indeed uh top ranked pay-per-view card happening um at the aforementioned step hub also this weekend um headlined by oscar valdez he's fighting miguel mariaga correct me if i'm wrong but isn't this the same mariaga who had the draw against um x-men walters uh a while back um thoughts on valdez who has said earlier this week that he's a little bit annoyed that when there's talk of these uh the big names at featherweight that uh, that that he's not included so uh says to me um seems to be some extra motivation here um, on his part i think jacob you're going to be at the fights this weekend uh, your thoughts on valdez mariaga yeah actually um mary mary uh, actually has a loss against uh, walter okay she okay that was sosa that, that had was uh, mariaga who had the loss my apologies yeah. Uh, no problem. Um, but yeah, I, I've been chomping at the bit to see a live fight at my beloved stuff hub. And I believe Gail will be there also. Um, but you know, I, I got to see Oscar Valdez on the Timothy Bradley, um, uh, Jesse Vargas card. And I had heard a lot about him and had watched some of his fights and, and that performance wasn't that impressive. And so I kind of had, had my doubts about him, but his following performances after that uh, were uh, spectacular. And I really do think I, I'm a you know converted believer now. I really do think that this kid has the goods um, and that he should be talked about. Um, and he seems to be ripping through people now. So um, I expect uh, Mary Aga to put up a fight, but I, I think Valdez has a lot of motivation to to really impress and, and showcase his skills and really, um, you know, um, put himself as one of those, uh, you know, up and comer, you know, used to be a blue chip, but uh, a serious, uh, you know, not only just champion, but contender. Uh, Gail, will you be at that fight as well? I will be there covering the card for Communities Digital News. Uh, yeah, Valdez is, is definitely blue chip, the real deal. I expect he'll put on a great show. These, these guys will come to bang. I don't think it'll go the distance. And he, Valdez, 
He's one of those guys, he learns. He learns from every fight. He's like a sponge. It, it's no surprise that when Jacob first saw him, he was, eh, okay. And, you know, then he gets to his next fight in Las Vegas, and my God, he just roared out of the chute. He was absolutely spectacular. He, he was the best fight on that card. I'm trying to think what card it was. He was on the undercard. And, and you know, it might have been the last Pacquiao fight, I'm trying to think. He was just phenomenal. So he has a chance to impress. This is a very important audience for him to impress in Southern California. Um, he is uh, Mexican-American, completely bilingual, comfortable in both English and Spanish. He's from Arizona, and uh, he needs to forge his ties a little tighter with the Southern California crowd. He'll have a, a wonderful chance to do that this weekend. Um, and the fact that, look, HBO should have picked up this bout. Let's be honest about that. Yes. Again, that's why, yes. that's why I continue to say that HBO is failing, particularly in comparison to Showtime. Um, missed as good of a look as this is for, for uh, Valdez Daniel to be the main event on this pay-per-view card. Yet still... The fact that if this would have been an HBO card after dark, regular HBO card, I don't care, he could have uh, re received more exposure, uh, especially what we see in from the featherweight lot on Showtime and, uh, and um, PBC. Well, the main thing that's hurting them now is, like I said, is that is that at least in the featherweight division, PBC knows what they're doing as far as marketing their guys whether it's frampton whether it's santa cruz selby's the exception to the rule but the issue is going to be now for valdez because when it comes down to it we all know i think the most optimistic thing for top rank would be a hundred thousand buys the most optimistic and there's a good chance that it's going to fall well below that. Right. Well below that. So the chance is better shine in, better show off, and ultimately win out against a perfectly, perfectly decent opponent in Marniaga. It's probably the best opponent that he's had, at least on paper, since Gradovich. So, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this is honestly his big test, and... Like I said, we all know what's going to come next. We all know what's coming next because of the issue with the PBC. In two weeks, the guy that most likely is going to be his marquee fight is fighting, Jojo Diaz. So that's that they need to show off in that event, and that's going to be a really, really good fight to me with Mariaga. The thing with Valdez also is going to be is he's not in his natural state, like. A, he wants to fight in Arizona, I think. He wants to fight in Arizona, New Mexico. He's more comfortable there. He's that he's he wants to be more of like the next Johnny Tappy in that sense. Yeah, but but the the numbers in the audience is in Southern California. It's just not that far. And if he really wants to cultivate the crowd and the money. Um, and eventually get them all to Vegas, which of course, you know, what Aaron wants to do. He has got to cultivate the Southern Californians who will be willing to drive over to Vegas to see him. I think oh, Aaron, don't, don't. Aaron spoke, though, that he said that the Valdez was going to be in, I think, Tucson before the yep. end of the year. Yep, he's going to do the fight in Tucson. They're going to try to build it there because the way it's going to wind up happening is with the way that JoJo Diaz has been presented, like I said, in Southern California, in Las Vegas. He's going to have the fan base there. And then Oscar Valdez is going to be able to start developing the Arizona, New Mexico fan base. And that's a natural rivalry. Uh, it, would, it would be. Yeah, no, it would be. It would be interesting. Where where are they staging it in Tucson? Is he talking to, about doing it, at, say, at the University of Arizona campus or what? I'm trying to think of the venue he'd use there. I, I don't remember what the actual venue was. I just remember him saying specifically that he wanted to get them to Tucson. Seems the, seems the only logical place. Yeah. I, I, that really does seem like, if, I mean, if they're in Tucson, that's all they've got, honestly. 
Um, Pretty much. And you know, and that's fine. You get uh, you're gonna. That's a very nice campus. Believe me, it's first class all the way. You're gonna have whatever the equivalent of the Galen Center, or, you know, Thomas and Mac Arena is there on the campus, and you do it there. Uh, let's move on. I'm going back to you, Daniel, with this. Uh, Gilberto Ramirez uh, hasn't fought against this his impressive title win over Arthur Abraham. I think November last year. Um, he was supposed to fight earlier this year, but was ruled out due to, uh, I want to say, a hand injury. Finally returned to the ring against uh, Max Bursuk. Um, this is a big fight for me for Gilberto Ramirez. Um, 168, look, it's kind of in flux right now with uh, Baudu Jack moving up to 75 and, De and, and DeGale is out due to injury suffered in that bout with Baudu Jack. So there's a window of for him Ramirez to really um, set himself apart uh, while these while the division is kind of in, in, in flux right now you don't know who's the guy he's he, there's a position there's a he's positioned to possibly set himself as to be the guy and eventually long term land a shot against triple G possibly next year It depends on well. This performance is not going to be one of the gauges to it because this is this is a gamey fight, in a sense. He's coming well, off that hand injury, but he has to still look good at the same time. Right. Well, I'm He's particularly still, looking down the road, not just this fight, but down the road, because Aram seems to be fully invested in him now, and I questioned that um, a couple of years ago. Um, Aram I, I, smells money. He smells money with this guy. I mentioned Triple G, Chavez Jr. possibly a possibility at some point. So I think there's a little bit of a of a recommitment here from Aram. Uh, uh, this could be sort of the jump off. It could in a way, but like I said, it, it depends on how good he looks. Because the thing that the the thing was, I want to I want to see if the Abraham fight was not just an aberration because before the abraham fight he zerto for all intents and purposes was not that impressive it took the it took that fight with abraham in order to show what he could do with his height and his reach if he doesn't do that again if he goes back to the performances that he had before abraham he's going to want to hurting himself in a way because Obviously, yeah. The, the obviously the WBC has a situation where guess what? You're gonna wind up probably fight fighting another Mexican anyway because it's it's David Benavides versus Porky Medina as a title eliminator, and David Benavides is is a kid that I've seen and he's not to be played with, and that's a really nice fight for Zerto. Should yeah, come into it. That's a real good fight. Like the Gale's gonna be the money fight. Like I said, with the division fights, it's gonna be the money fight because just because it's in the UK. The only there's, def say again. There's another good reason that a fight with Benavides would be an excellent fight. Benavides was Golovkin's sparring partner for Jacobs, so. You know, Benavides knows what Golovkin has under under the hood. Um, you know, and Ramirez fighting Benavides, you know, it's a bit of a surrogate because they've got that in common. And yeah, but Zordo is the guy everybody's sort of dangling out there as, you know, you know, the fresh new face and the guy that, you know, let's let's use him as the test for all the other big names and put on a real exciting fight with a young up-and-coming guy but you're right he has to show he has to not only win he has to be flashy he has to entertain um he's got all the goods he's got all the little uh, ingredients it takes to be that star that you know bob aram can really run with he his english one thing he has done in this time off his english has uh, taken a quantum leap. He now does interviews in English with relative ease. It is really stunning 
how good his English is. I mean, seemingly all of a sudden. Um, you know, he's a good looking guy. He loves the media. He loves the attention. Um, you know, he knows what it takes to go out there and, you know, hit the circuit. He's been really good about showing up at venues. Yeah. You know, now he's got to back it up with the performance in the ring. So we'll see. But he, he definitely has a very strong fan base and growing. Jacob. Yeah, not much more I could say. I'm excited to be able to see him live, and uh, I agree. He has to put on an impressive performance, you know, being out of the ring for so long because of the hand injury off of a, a sensational performance against Abraham. Granted, Abraham is a little long in the tooth. Um, it's not the same Abraham back in the day, but, um, you know, if he can do the right things um, and, like, you know, entertain – and, you know, Gail hit on it. You know, he is very media savvy. And, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, that they maybe uh, English isn't their first language or, or whatnot. I mean, it goes a long way when they're able to, um, you know, even just uh, look at like a Nadia Golovkin, like just learning a little bit of, you know, whether it's Spanish or, or English. It, it goes a long way, I think. Um, it shows that uh, you, you know, you're not kind of giving up on your your nationality in, in a sense, but you're also trying to reach out into the, the uh, audience, the popular audience, uh, which, you know, the United States market, um, as ignorant as it can be sometimes and, and, and kind of like, what have you done for me lately? It is, you know, the big market that everybody tries to get into. So um, I hope he, you know, he comes out and puts in an exciting fight and uh, you know, I expect him to win pretty easily. Um, Justin Magdaleno, uh, fresh off of his winner with no need to donate to claim the uh, junior be junior featherweight title at 122, making his first defense against Edelson Dos Santos, um, also on this uh, step up card. I'll just open it up for anybody who wants to respond quickly. Any thoughts on this bout? Another bout where the A name should really win easily and to keep his momentum needs to put on a good performance. I think he will. Uh, it's a good venue for him. Um, he's, he's looked good. He's looked very good in training. I, I don't think he's going to have a lick of a problem. Yeah. It, can, it does tie up the bit more of what this card ultimately feels. The Valdez fight aside, it just feels like a showcase card. Yeah. He, you know, it's almost... It's almost the early season warm up, you know, for the top rank stable. It's did you get there, you know, kind of shake off the winter doldrums and you know, get get in front of a crowd. It's a venue everyone likes. It's to our great surprise, it's mid April and it's gonna be ninety friggin' degrees out there. <laughs> I didn't really expect it's gonna be that warm. Um, but you know, everybody's like Jacob and like me. You know, the, the regulars um, are eager to get the Southern California boxing season there underway. You know, we we go see, you know, just about anything <laughs> on a nice day out there. So, you know, Top Rank's going to get a decent crowd. It'll be interesting to see what the ticket sales are. I don't think it'll be a sellout, but I don't think it'll be empty either. Um, you know, because it is, for a lot of people, the first opportunity they've had to go see, you know, a, a real good world-class um, set of uh, athletes, even if their opponents aren't quite up to snuff. Um, lastly, uh, speaking of showcases, the uh, debut of uh, Shakur Stevenson, most remember him for um, his loss in the Olympic finals and his re emotional response to that. Um, a lot of talk about who he will sign with, sign a bill with James Prince, which leads to a promotional uh, relationship with um, Aram. He makes his professional debut against Ed Edgar Brito. Um, six round bout featherweight. I'll go to you, Jacob. Uh, thoughts, level of excitement here for the uh, pro, pro, de pro debut, excuse me, of Shakur Stevenson. Very, very excited. Um, you know, I, I want to see Stevenson, you know, uh, granted it's his debut and they're not putting anybody, you know, that's going to probably give him much of a challenge, but I just, I want to see how he does in the ring. And they're already, you know, promoting him on the next uh, top-ranked card, um, I believe, 
Um, so, I mean, I, I think they fully expect him to win. But um, I love – that's one of the reasons I love going to these fights so early is to see, you know, debut fighters or up-and-coming talent and see, like, what really – is there to sift through and, and see who I think will be a contender later on. So I, I'm very excited uh, to see him and see um, if he can you know capitalize on his popularity from uh, the Olympics. Uh, the promotion of Stevenson, uh, whether by his handlers or by the uh, fighter, by the kid himself. Um, I heard him on the uh, morning punch in, I want to say last week. Um, Judging by that, judging by other interviews of him, judging uh, by his comments on uh, Twitter in the Graham Gale, uh, opinionated kid, um, not afraid to speak his mind. Your thoughts on Stevenson um, heading, not just the fighter, but him, the personality, um, heading into his professional debut, particularly given your, uh, given your work in, in the boxing media? You know, he has everything it takes to be a big star. You do need a defined personality. You, he's got one of those million dollar smiles. He enjoys the attention. You know, when, when you are working with these guys as a member of the news media, and, and I also look through a prism of the fact that I do public relations for a living um, as well. You know, you can tell when they're being a good soldier and you know, doing what's expected of them and they, and they do it. And I wouldn't say they do it grudgingly, but they don't do it with any real enthusiasm, all right? And they, they do what's required, and it's all good, and then they move on. It is a joy when you have guys that really connect. They, they, they love the attention that goes with boxing, you know, the, the stardom, um, the chance to talk, you know. He, it, it, the the role models are guys, at least in the current game, like like Keith Thurman. You know, Keith Thurman should be going on, you know, all the nighttime talk shows. He's super entertaining. He does every interview asked of him, whether he's got a fight or not, you know, and he'll just chat about world events and religion and playing the flute and all kinds of crazy stuff, you know. And Mayweather, same thing. Uh, you know, you see some of these young up and coming guys who relish that part of it. It is not, you know, just just another task on the job. They enjoy it as just as much as what they're doing in the ring. And he he seems to be relishing it. He he's one of those personalities you just gravitate to. He was that way going into the Olympic Games. Everyone knew that's one of those guys you want to keep your eye on. You know, he felt he got robbed. You know, he really thinks he got robbed of a, of a gold medal but opportunity, but um, it's not going to matter. So hopefully he'll put on a good show. He'll circle in the arena. He'll meet and greet. Um, you know, that's what he's he, – just as much as he's there to fight, he's there to do all of that too, to mingle, to be, see and be seen, and he looks like he's perfectly capable of doing it and he's only going to get better at it which is terrific. And boxing needs guys like that. Enthusiastic, million dollar smile guys who can back it up, back it up in the ring. Uh, let's put a cap to this episode, uh, Daniel. Uh, talk about the debut of Shakur Stevenson. It's a lot of buzz here in the tri-state area because we already know where he's gonna fight next, the Prudential Center. So he's going to make a big splash in the home crowd. And Gil hit it the nail on the head in the fact that the aspect that this kid just has that great personality. He has a great smile. He has that feel. He has that clip in the Olympics where he didn't win, but you felt his passion. It didn't look like a day in the office for him. And I know as many people as they don't like Bob Aaron and they don't like top rank, they do an exceptional job with Olympians. They do really, really well building up Olympians. Whether, like I said, they were whether building up for Dejo, building up the La Jolla. Hell, like going said, back twenty five years, twenty five plus years to the class of uh, 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 of eighty eight, with yep. folks like uh, Carbajal, uh, Kennedy, McKin Kennedy McKinney, and others. 
on oh. the ground. And look what they're doing with Michael Conlon, for God's sakes. Yep. They packed, they packed the theater at Madison Square Garden for Conlon's professional debut. That is crazy impressive. You're yep. absolutely right. Now, that's, well, I, I, I remember somebody talking to some people. Some did somebody I remember said trying to dismiss that by saying, "Oh, how many people are just there to see McGregor?" I'm like, "Dude, they were there to see Colin." Oh no 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 no! See those? You're right. Those tickets were purchased long before anybody knew McGregor was coming along with the deal. Yeah, I mean that sucker sold out like that. It was, yep. it was the perfect package. It was, you know, let's recall St. Patrick's Day night in New York. You you had the you know the smaller venue easily sold it out you know it was not a bad card and you know just a fun thing to do on St Patrick's Day night with the Pride of Ireland it was brilliant and then you layer on top of it McGregor you know and then you layer on top of it Kovalev showing up and deciding to get into it with him it was great you know that's, that's what boxing needs it was it was all good clean fun. Yep, and that's then that's they're gonna do the short. That's why the reason you're gonna do the Prudential Center. You're gonna do it in this home base, where where everybody's gonna show up for him. Like New York, New Jersey area, they're gonna love this. They love this kid already, and they're and they're gonna come out in droves to see him because they see the potential there. Yeah, it, it's you know the word we're looking for, and I don't know that any of us have said it yet. Charisma. This kid has charisma to spare. You, yep. you know it when you see it. You feel it when you're around guys like that. And people want that in their athletes and want guys like that to root for. And how can you not love this kid? You know, yeah, let's just hope he has a great performance. That's really going to be important. Yeah, and that's the whole thing to it. And in the day and age where we've, when part of it is Floyd's fault that it has become so business oriented where you see a guy come in and you already mean he's already thinking about what's best for business what's best for my business you don't get that with Shakur Stevenson you get a kid that just wants to get in there put on a good show and prove that he is a good fighter so they, they said stuff is going to get a hell of a treat obviously like i said he's going to have a, his olympic teammate there clarissa shields those who are arguably were the faces of the 2016 real team both men and women so it's good to see him there it's good to see olympic support like i said clarissa was her teammates they showed up to support when she fought in michigan and you're gonna see it, like I said. Uh, Mike, uh, you mentioned Michael Conlon. Michael Conlon's next fight is gonna be in Chicago, which is just genius, absolutely perfect. You know yeah. that that's how you build a fighter is getting them around the country in front of their natural fan base. And you know we've seen some of it. I'd like to see more of it. Yeah, and I think we want to uh, to shut the show down on on shut down the episode on that note. And then look, folks, we actually did the show in under two hours. Oh was my God! Um, Ring the bell. Yeah, and um, I know there was some other fights we was that's on the ledger. I know one of my favorite fighters, Alana Tete, he's also fighting this weekend in England. Um, doubleheader in Japan uh, with Kazuta Aoka and um, Tapales, flyweight and bantamweight titles. Just too much boxing. Didn't have all the, enough time to talk about it all, but still. Just to mention those fights, it's out there. We know about them. Um, going around the panel here, going around the hangout here. Ladies first, always, Gail from Communities Digital News. For, for those who want to talk to Sweet Science or uh, read your accounts of Dancing with the Stars or anything else like that, uh, let the folks know where they can find you. You can find me at Communities Digital News, which is com, C-O-M-M, digi, D-I-G-I news, com, diginews.com. I float around the internet under my name, Gail Falkenthal, or under PR Pro San Diego. Uh, and you can look at my YouTube channel for a video of the Canelo Media workout from yesterday and get a look at what a little heavier Canelo looks like. 
and all the weight gain appears to be in the legs. Very interesting. I'm sure we'll talk about that as that fight comes a little closer. Uh, Daniel Carpio of the Inscriber for folks who want to talk um, boxing or the, my, or the NBA, excuse me, specifically the Miami Heat. Uh, let the folks know where they can hit you up. You can find me on Twitter at Ruckus99. Like I said, you can always catch me here, Pound from Box Report. And I just, like I said, uploaded the last episode a few hours ago with my show with the folks for Boxing News, John Francis. Like I said, we do the same thing. We talk about the latest boxing events, about the news, and we're and we're gearing up, folks. We're, we're going to have two weeks of really, really big events about to happen. Including now, Golden Boy card is airing now on ESPN2. <laughs> Which has been quite good. It was quite a wild opening fight. <laughs> uh, Jacob from Jab for Boxing. Uh, for folks who want to talk to Sweet Science or anything else, let the folks know where they can find you. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Mike, for having me on the show. Uh, you can find me, you'll find me at the fights. Uh, locally here, you know, if there's a fight going off, I like to support. I don't care what promotion it is. Uh, I'll support them all. I just want to see good boxing and support the sport that I love, that we all love. But uh, I can be found on Twitter at JRATM23. And if I could, Mike, I'd like to give a little shout-out to uh, uh, a Twitter friend, uh, Kyle Reardon. He's actually making his first uh, feature film, yeah, Nowhere to Run. So if you guys help him out, he's a young filmmaker from Boston uh, area or Massachusetts area, and so, um, you know, go to Kickstarter, know where to run, help him out. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, watching us on the live show. I want to thank both from Truth and Facts and Boxing, Isha, casual boxing fan, Sean as well, I believe, who checked us out on the live show, had some comments on the, on the show. Uh, for those who want to talk boxing or anything else with me, you know what it is. Uh, Brother JR on Twitter at Brother JR76. Um, as I stated to begin the show, if you want to find out all things about Power for Power Box Report, blog page is the blog page is the place you want to go to. P4Pboxingreport.wordpress.com is the link. Um, next week, uh, we will do a recap of the Showtime card with uh, Porter Berto, Charlo Hatley, um, Serrano, and Santana. Also, do a recap of the Top Right Pay Per View card. And um, it's almost here, folks. Um, next week, we will do a um, big-time preview of Anthony Joshua, uh, Vladimir Klitschko. Uh, talk about that fight in full. Uh, we may, we may, I'm not sure yet, but we may, uh, or I may, do a uh, show immediately after that fight. I don't know. Just see how my schedule uh, goes. So you may see a live pound for pound show immediately following uh, Joshua and Klitschko. But yeah. Full in-depth, full-scale uh, preview of Anthony Joshua, of Vladimir Klitschko, the most anticipated bout um, of the year up to this point. Uh, possibly the biggest U UK heavyweight bout ever, most anticipated UK bout heavyweight ever, one of the most anticipated bouts in UK boxing um, history. Uh, it's big over there, 90,000 plus. Um, hardcore fans even here. Uh, Sorry, uh, Fraud. You no longer have the biggest crowd in Wembley, mate. Right, <laughs> right, because mm. it's going to exceed uh, Frotch Grove, that rematch. So, yeah, um, uh, monster, monster bout over there in the UK that even has us hardcore fans here in the US uh, talking about it, buzzing about it. So, full in scale, in depth preview of Joshua Klitschko next week. So, uh, for Gail from Communities Digital News, from Jacob from Jab Hook, from Daniel the Inscriber, uh, I'm your host, Michael. This has been episode 166 of the Pound Pound Box Report. Uh, we will see you next week, guys. Um, have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you. Yes, Locked yes, sir. Fired.